Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I'll show you a horror film, The Scourge. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The movie begins in an old church based in Harbordford, Washington. Regrettably, the church was caught in a fire due to a defective rocket science project. Firefighters arrive on site to quickly extinguish the fire. A fireman goes inside the church to search for any salvageable items. However, he breaks something beneath the floor during his search. The hole he made unleashes a parasite called Scourge that quickly enters his body through his navel. He stands up and pretends nothing happened to him. Meanwhile, a local man, Scott, visits an old friend named Jesse, who happens to be in town, but he only observes her from across the road because he doesn't want to bother her. Coincidentally, Jess's uncle, a sheriff, finds him observing Jesse and her hormones. Sheriff warns Scott not to get near Jesse if he doesn't want to burden her anymore. So Scott is ready to leave until Jesse approaches him. Jesse invites him inside the house, chatting about their struggles in life for the past years. Their conversation abruptly ends though, because Scott has a hockey match in an hour. At the fire station, Fireman indulges himself with various foods to feed the scourge inside him. His colleagues even try to give him beer, but his body strangely expels them. He then tries to take a shower to relieve himself, but his health worsens as his eyes fill up with diabetic blood and his skin peels off because the scourge slowly kills him by eating his innards and even diabetics. Fireman decides to transfer the scourge to his girlfriend, since it needs a new host. He arrives at a hockey game where Scott's girlfriend, Lydia, watches Scott actively play in the ice rink. He crashes the game and brings Lydia to a locker room. It's evident that Lydia is cheating on Scott with the fireman, simply because she willingly joins him into the locker room. Fireman kneels in front of Lydia, inadvertently dropping his badge. He pretends to give her a tongue massage, but opens his mouth to transfer the scourge to Lydia. Without a satisfied massage, Lydia angrily walks out of the room, leaving a lone fireman who's suffering from intensive bleeding. He tries escaping through the back door, but he only falls to his death. Scott shortly finds the hormone-smelly badge inside the locker room before suspecting his girlfriend of cheating on him. After the hockey match, Scott introduces Lydia and Jesse to each other, but it's obvious that his girlfriend is jealous of Jesse. Scott then temporarily drags Lydia away, shows her the hormone-smelly badge, and confronts her alleged affair with a fireman, but Lydia denies his accusation. Scott eventually trusts her word. The two lovers shortly reconcile. At night, Lydia misses the dinner date with Scott because she goes to a bar instead. She's unaware that Scott is following her behind, who witnesses her blatant cheating for sensually dancing with a roofer. He brings Lydia to the restroom for a smelly workout, but he doesn't know that Lydia intends to transfer the scourge to him. The roofer leaves the restroom while carrying the scourge. Meanwhile, Scott confronts Lydia for her audacity to cheat and lie, but Lydia strangely stays quiet at the corner. Scott then approaches her to turn her around, and there he discovers Lydia's bloodshot eyes and bleeding mouth. Since the scourge has eaten her innards, she drops dead on the floor. The two best friends of her scream at the sight of her gruesome death. Scott flees from the bar and attempts to escape entirely from the problem, but he eventually goes back to town after thinking about the sexy Jess being all alone. Scott arrives at Jess's house to see her. However, Jesse is mad and suspects he got involved in trouble again due to blood stains all over his body. But Scott explains he didn't do anything bad, and he knows her sheriff uncle would undoubtedly suspect him instantly. Jesse eventually allows him to stay overnight, but he needs to leave immediately first thing in the morning. Meanwhile, sheriff and deputy arrive at the bar to investigate the crime scene. They learn from Lydia's friends that Scott was the last person near Lydia before she died, which instantly marks him as a prime suspect. Sheriff then contacts Jesse if she happens to know where Scott is. But Jesse lies, saying that she hasn't seen Scott since afternoon. The following day, Scott quickly changes into new clothes upon waking up. He then meets Jesse, who's suddenly scared of him after watching the news about the murder of Lydia. Scott explains again it wasn't him, because he already found Lydia with bloodshot eyes and bleeding right before she died. However, Jesse remains skeptical and immediately contacts the police. Still, Scott asserts he's innocent until Jesse reveals a badge, which implies that Lydia's illicit affair with the fireman is a perfect motive for him to commit the murder. While Jesse calls the police, Scott temporarily disassociates as he connects the incidents together. He thinks Lydia caught a disease or virus from firemen, and soon the disease might spread across the town, so he initiates an investigation to know the root cause of the incidents. He then turns to Jesse and assures her that he's not a murderer. Sheriff unexpectedly arrives early at Jess's house to address his niece's concern while completely oblivious of Scott's presence behind him. Scott uses the opportunity to sneak outside and leave his sheriff comforts Jesse with his bulletproof muscles. But he soon discovers Scott's clothes in the trash. He gets mad at Jesse for hiding Scott from him, but Jesse defends that Scott is innocent. 
Sheriff then explains to Jesse why she shouldn't be defending people like Scott. Two years ago, Scott's father stole car parts, but Scott took his place because he was sick. Sheriff concludes that Scott's family are trash. Suddenly, Sheriff receives an emergency call from Deputy, reporting a loose roofer is creating a hostile environment in the mall. At the mall, Deputy refers to the roofer, who's attacking shoppers to transfer the scourge. But Sheriff and Deputy quickly dispatch him on the spot to prevent more damage. They call an ambulance to secure his corpse. Soon after, the roofer's corpse is delivered to the hospital by a paramedic. Meanwhile, Scott activates a fire alarm system in a nearby building to empty the fire station, so he can sneak in and learn about firemen. He discovers that his last mission was at the church. Just then, a guard enters the room to watch the news about the attack at the mall, and Scott immediately hides under the table. Scott also watches the news and recognizes the roofer from last night. At the same time, Jesse watches the news and hears a little girl describing the roofer had bloodshot eyes. Upon hearing the little girl's description, Jesse finally realizes that Scott did tell her the truth, so she immediately contacts Scott to arrange a meetup. Soon, the two friends meet, and Jesse claims what they're dealing with is a parasite and not a virus, because the symptoms only occur to one person at a time. Afterward, they travel to the church and deduce that Fireman must have got it first, then Lydia, and recently to the roofer. They discover Fireman's axe, which was stuck in the hole, smells like vinegar. Next, they go into the basement and discover an old letter dated on 4th of May, 1871. The letter says there's a parasite named Corrigia, or Scourge, that is preserved and sealed from the world. Even though it's a small amount of information, it's enough to jumpstart their research. They first visit the hospital, where the roofer was sent to locate the last person who came in contact with him. They learn that the paramedic delivered the roofer's body. The hospital staff says the paramedic usually hangs around in the skate park after work. Afterward, Jess and Scott split up to do their own task. While Jessa goes to the library archive, Scott searches for the paramedic. At the park, Scott finds the paramedic already dead, who's surrounded by other skaters. The skater girl claims the paramedic attacked her before he died. Scott now knows the scourge is inside the skater girl, so he demands her to come with him. However, his forceful order irritates the skaters, so they knock him down and report him to sheriff and deputy. Meanwhile, Jessa surrounds herself with documents related to the scourge at the library arca. She reads about a silversmith at Harborford, who died from a lightning struck during a murder trial. Fortunately, his wife and son lived on, and eventually bore offspring. Afterward, Jesse visits the silversmith's great-granddaughter, Blacksmith, to learn more about his past and relation with the Scourge. Upon arriving, Blacksmith willingly relays to her the history of her ancestor. In 1871, the silversmith killed people due to the Scourge. The church then sent a goetic magic practitioner to extract the Scourge from the silversmith under the guise of a murder trial. These practitioners were known for their hoods and black cross rings. For the extraction, they need electricity to force the Scourge out of its host. Thus, they chained the silversmith under a rain and allowed the lightning to strike him. The electrocution released the Scourge, and the practitioners immediately pulled it out from the silversmith, and then submerged it in wine. The silversmith survived the lightning strike, but the practitioners claimed he's dead to relieve the people of their worries, since they knew him as a murderer. Next, they exiled him to the east, where he eventually settled down until his death. Upon his death, all of his possessions were sent back to Harborford. Back at the present, Blacksmith allows Jesse to see the silversmith's possession in the coach house. There, she sees the extraction tong and the demonologist handbook on the desk. While she reads the handbook, a one-eyed man strangely watches her behind the window, but he quickly disappears when Jesse looks outside. Suddenly, Blacksmith calls Jesse from outside to tell her that her sheriff uncle arrested Scott for the succeeding deaths. Meanwhile, Scott returns to prison along with a bald guy who claims to know Scott's father. Mr. Baldy mentions Scott's father was lucky to die early because he escaped Sheriff's corruption, who frames and charges people who don't pay him monthly. Scott then realizes that Sheriff planted car parts in his father's property to frame him of thievery, just because his father spent the money on his cancer treatment instead of paying monthly to Sheriff. In addition, Mr. Baldy mentions the skinny skater girl he met, vomited her guts out before falling off the bridge and died. Scott freezes in place upon learning the fact that the scourge is inside Mr. Baldy. Scott avoids Mr. Baldy and calls Sheriff to bring him out. However, Sheriff doesn't listen to him, so he kicks Mr. Baldy to force Sheriff to take him out. Mr. Baldy crashes on the metal bunker and falls, but he eventually stands up with bloodshot eyes. He then attacks Sheriff just in time after Scott gets out of the cell and transfers the scourge to him. Scott uses the opportunity to escape from the police, but Sheriff and Deputy are quick to their feet as they chase after him with their patrol car. Not long after, the two cops corner Scott in an alley road. 
Scott kneels to imply he's surrendering, but he bravely reprimands Sheriff for taking advantage of his sick father for his selfish demands. Just then, Jesse unexpectedly exits from the patrol car, points a taser at her uncle, and shuns him for his remorseless and abusive power. Afterward, she fires the taser at her uncle the moment Deputy points a gun at Scott. The taser grounds Sheriff, forcing out the scourge to reveal itself. Deputy guns down Sheriff, but Sheriff surprisingly survives the bullets and kills Deputy back. Meanwhile, Jess and Scott run inside the patrol car to pin and trap Sheriff in between the trunk and wall. The car now leaks gas due to the collision, and Scott sets the car ablaze using a flare. The car blows up shortly, burning Sheriff with it. Soon after, an ambulance, backup cops, and firefighters arrive at the site. Therefore, it's time for Jess and Scott to lay low inside a diner to recuperate and discuss the scourge. Jessa has brought the demonologist handbook with her to show Scott its valuable information about demons and angels collected by the church for years that was mainly used by the geotic practitioners. It also includes detailed information about the scourge. First, the scourge consumed six to nine human innards to be able to grow and self-propagate. Second, electricity can be used to get it out of its host. Third, its weakness is alcohol. Fourth, there's no way to kill the scourge because it only hides inside the body and uses it as a shield from danger. Jess and Scott then realize that the Scourge inside Sheriff is still alive, so they rush back to the explosion site to see where the Scourge might have transferred. They see the photographer pretending to be a firefighter, so he could take pictures of Sheriff's corpse. Since the Scourge is still alive, it transfers into the photographer. Soon after, the cops catch the photographer and force him to leave the crime scene. Consequently, the one-eyed man from the coach house appears at the crime scene and introduces himself as an Interpol agent who's on site to examine Sheriff's corpse. Meanwhile, Jess and Scott follow the photographer into a bar because they need to isolate the scourge quickly before it reaches its next phase. And so, the two friends book a hotel room as part of their first plan. While Jesse mingles and drinks alcohol with the photographer in the bar, Scott prepares the dosing wine and equipment for electrocution in the room. Afterward, Jesse lures the photographer into the room and then they quickly tie him up after he drops his guard. Scott then attaches wire to the photographer and lets the electricity ground him down but the electricity cuts off shortly because the voltage is too strong. So Jesse activates the emergency power lever in the bathroom to resume their operation, but the moment she returns, the scourge is transferred to Scott. By then, the scourge only needs one more human innards before it reaches its full size to propagate, so it controls Scott to attack Jesse. It's about to transfer to her body, but Jesse reeks from alcohol, so it stops and hides back inside Scott. Time is running out, so Scott volunteers to sacrifice himself and allows Jesse to beat the scourge out of him. Jesse quickly acts and stabs him with a broken lamp on his side. The scourge immediately comes out. Jesse uses the tong to extract it out of Scott and submerges it in a bowl of wine. Meanwhile, the photographer wakes up and leaves the room to call for help. The movie ends with Jess and Scott surviving a havoc caused by the scourge. The one-eyed man then approaches them, who's searching for the scourge. Jess and Scott accompany him as he incinerates the scourge at 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit to permanently kill it. Afterward, Jessa recognizes his black cross ring and realizes that he's a goetic practitioner. The one-eyed man informs them that many scourges were already killed by his association centuries ago. He then points at a scar and asserts the last time he killed a scourge cost him his right eye 30 years ago. The one-eyed man shortly bids goodbye and leaves Jess and Scott alone to decide for their new future together. On the other side, the photographer confined in the hospital is caught eating human guts from a corpse, which insinuates the scourge successfully propagated on its own, and the battle has just begun. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.